Right. In this video, I'm going to be talking about absolute extrema and how we can find absolute extrema or how we can find locations of absolute extrema. And so what we need to start with is discussion of the extreme value theorem. And so what we're saying is if a function is continuous on a closed interval, then it must take a maximum and a minimum value on that closed interval. So let me just kind of draw you a couple of pictures of that happening. Okay, uh, closed interval mean, means it needs to include its endpoints, right? A less than or equal to x, less than or equal to b, or the square brackets mean the same thing. So maybe we have, I don't know, a continuous function that includes, you know, on a closed interval, including both of its endpoints. Here we've got a maximum, and there we've got a minimum. Uh, let me draw another one. Uh, maybe, let's see. You know, something like that. Okay, it was continuous. It's on a closed interval. This is the minimum value right here. And the maximum value occurred right up here at a critical point. And that could have been sharp, and it would have still been continuous, and it still would have been a critical point, and it still would have been the maximum, the maximum on the closed interval A to B. Okay. Now, the reason that this is true is really what uh, the ways that you can draw a function and not have a minimum or a maximum value okay uh, let's say let me draw you one okay let's say it was a closed interval it wasn't quite continuous but for me that wasn't the best yeah it wasn't quite continuous everywhere we say we had a removable discontinuity there's this is not continuous and there is no max. Now, a lack of continuity won't guarantee that you won't have a maximum, right? We still have a minimum right here, an absolute minimum on that closed interval. But it doesn't guarantee you anymore because we could have situations like that. And if we were to not have a closed interval, so maybe uh, the interval was not closed, we could have a situation like I don't know, something like that, where we had neither a maximum nor a minimum, right? We don't actually ever achieve that, that y value there, the y value of the whole. So there's no max over here, and there's no min over here. Okay, so that's why we need those two conditions, that it be continuous on a closed interval. Okay. Well, let's actually find some of these maximum values. All right, now on the topic of finding these, I need to give you kind of a set of steps. So if you notice up above, hold on, let me, you can see that absolute extrema are either occurring at the end or at critical points. And that's going to kind of be our guiding principle here, because if we know that absolute extrema occur at endpoints or critical points, then if we're looking for an absolute extrema, we know where we need to look. We need to look at endpoints and critical points. Okay, so our steps for finding absolute maximum and minima are going to be first, we're going to identify the critical points. Find the critical points. Okay, and just to remind you, the critical points are going to be places where the derivative is equal to zero or the derivative fails to exist. Okay, then, second, we're going to evaluate the function that we're trying to maximize or minimize. Okay, we're going to evaluate f at each critical point and each end. And then, from that list of you know evaluated f values, we're going to just find the maximum or minimum, depending on what we're looking for. Just, just pick it out of the table. So find the maximum from your list of candidates. And because we know that absolute extrema occur at endpoints or critical points, and we say that those are really the only candidates to be an absolute max or a min. Uh, we oftentimes call this the candidate test or the closed interval test. Okay, so for example, we're going to find the minimum value of f of x equals x to the third minus 12x plus 25 on the closed interval negative 5 to 3. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to start by finding the critical points. Step one, critical points. Okay. So we're going to need to take f prime, and that's going to be 3x squared minus 12. We need to find out whether that's equal to 0 or undefined. Looks like this thing's never going to be undefined, so I can just find where it's equal to 0. That's 3 times x squared minus 4, so that's 3 times x plus 2 times x minus 2. Okay, f prime equals 0 at x equals negative 2 and x equals 2. That 3, it doesn't really contribute any zeros. Okay, so 2, uh oh Now I need to evaluate my function at the critical points and at the end points. What we're going to usually do this is make a table. You don't have to make a table. You can just kind of just do all of these things separately. Uh, but sometimes it's helpful to just start with x and f of x. And you might be like, dude, you're not leaving enough room for step three. But step three is just like go find the biggest, or in our case, smallest, most negative number or least number we can find. So I'm going to consider the endpoints, negative 5 and 3, and negative 2 and 2. Okay. So if x is equal to negative 5, I'm going to just I'm going to do the evaluation step uh, while I've got it paused, so you don't have to watch me do a bunch for it. Okay, there you go. So we ran x through f of x, and we got some different values. And you know, I'm not using a calculator here, so I'm just going to kind of show you what I'm thinking. Okay, so we want the minimum value. Okay, and step three is just going to be okay. Go into the f column and say which of these is the least, and this one is going to be the least because it's got the most negativity. Okay, it's going to end up being negative 25 plus 85 is negative 40, and I don't even see negative 40 on any of the other. I don't see anything as negative as negative 40 over there, um, and they're getting stuff added back to it. So this is definitely the minimum value. Okay, so step three is just like, oh, um, I guess I kind of drew the arrow backwards. Um, is Step three is, you know, just find the min or the max. I guess I should probably point out that if I was looking for the maximum, I'm pretty sure it would have been that guy right there. Okay. So we're going to give a conclusion, a statement. Okay, I would say the minimum value of f of x on negative 5 to 3 is, and pay very close attention to what they're asking you for. They are asking you for a value of f right so what we need to do is be giving a value of f and so that's negative 125 plus 60 plus 25 which i think is negative 80. Okay. another thing i want to point out to you is that um and kind of two giveaways that this is the process we're going to need to take first of all they give you a closed interval right okay less than or equal to or the square brackets those are both that's closed interval Okay, but another thing is they say the minimum. Okay, if you go back and look, for the most part, we talk about a local minimum or a relative minimum. And we haven't talked about the minimum value until just now. Okay, so that's, that's an example of me carrying out the candidate test. I might do a couple more of these at the end of this video, but I've got an examples video of me doing endless candidates test, closed interval test problems. And I'm sure I'll have that linked in the description or, you know, at the end of the video or whatever. Um, so I don't want to just sit here and do a whole bunch of these for you. Now, one thing I do want to talk to you about is the special situation where we have either one or zero interior critical points. Okay, these are some situations where we can not av absolutely have to run the candidate's test and go through that whole rig. Model. So let me just kind of give you a quick question. So I'm going to give you a picture of F prime. And I'm going to ask you, on the closed interval 0 to 5, where does f have its absolute minimum value? Okay, so I want you to sit and think about it for a second. I want you to notice that f prime does not change signs. There are no interior critical points on this closed interval. And since f prime is positive the whole time, my approximate 
um, you know, sketch of the graph of f would be, well, it's going to increase, uh, kind of concave up because the slope is increasing, but then it's going to be uh, concave down because the slope is decreasing, and then it's going to start concave up again after that, you know. And so it's going to go like that. And since f prime was positive the entire time, the function only increased, meaning it had its absolute minimum value at x equals zero. Okay, and that would be because f prime of x is greater than zero uh, for all x whoops, between zero and five. Let me switch it up a little bit and ask you a similar question. You know, maybe I could switch this up to be a particle motion situation. Then. Object moves along the x-axis with velocity given by uh, the continuous function v of t, where you know v is measured in some velocity units and t is measured in some time units, right? And I could ask you, at what time is the object farthest to the left? Okay. Now, if you look, v is only negative and then only positive, okay? which means that the object was only moving to the left and then only moving to the right, meaning that it had its absolute minimum position or it was farthest to the left at t equals 2. Okay? Because I kind of meant to say b is only negative before t equals 2 and only positive after t equals 2, but I got caught up because I was thinking v is negative, so we're moving to the left only, and then only positive means we're moving to the right only. So it's like, um, you know, we're moving to the left, and then we move, start moving back to the right, and so that was my farthest left point, okay, is what's going on here. That's the one interior critical point situation. Okay. I can't ask you at this point in the course when the object is farthest to the right. Okay. Um, because if I was to try to draw the graph of, okay, so this is going to be um, x of t versus t. Okay. I'm just going to try to draw the position function. So it went and it decreased, right? We're looking for the absolute minimum value of position. So it only decreased, and then it only increased. But we don't know if the amount of increase after that minimum was greater than or less than the amount of decrease before the minimum. Right? It, it might have not even recovered as much by 5. Okay, so we don't have enough information to say how much, you know, x increased by on that interval or how much it decreased by through here, uh, it is going to have to do with the area underneath that curve. But uh, we'll talk about that later in the course. OK, and the last example I got for you is going to be uh, another particle motion, but it's algebraic. And it's when is the particle farthest to the right? So first, I want to point out, when they ask you when, the answer is going to be a t value. Okay, so we are looking for a t value, not the rightmost position. Okay, sometimes we will ask you for the rightmost position, but this time we're asking for the t value at which it's farthest to the right. Okay, and we are assuming we've got an, ob an object moves along the x axis and its position at time t is given by x of t equals 2t to the 3 minus 3t to the 2 plus 2. Okay, so what we need to do is we're going to need to run the candidates test on this. Okay. Unless we find that it just has one interior critical point, uh, then I'll just tell you what you could do, but I'm still going to run the candidates test just to you know, give you a couple of examples on this video. So I'm going to start by taking the derivative of x. First step, find critical points. So x prime of t is 6t to the 2 minus 6t plus 0. Copy that problem, right? Yep, okay. It's going to trust. 
So this is equal to 6t times t minus 1. Okay, yeah, I have two interior critical points. Okay, and I'm going to say x prime equals 0 at t equals 0 and t equals 1. Now I'm going to be thinking, well, okay, I've got my critical points, I've got my endpoints, I'm ready to make my table. So it's going to be t and x of t. So my t values I'm interested in are negative 1 and 2 and 0 and 1. So I will, what was I going to do? Oh, I was going to plug them into x. Okay, I like... 0, that's going to be 2. I like that one. I like 1 also. That's going to be 2 plus 2 is 4 minus 3 is 1. And when I plug in negative 1, I'm going to get negative 2 minus 3 plus 2 is negative 3. And when t is 2, I'm going to get 2 times 8 is 16. This looks like definitely candidate for fuzz to the right. Minus 3t squared is minus 12 plus 2, that's equal to 6, and this is equal to negative 3. So, we'll say it is farthest to the right at t equals 2. Right, because I found that this was the greatest value, and I backtracked that to the time value. Okay, farthest to the right is the maximum value of x. Okay. And there are a couple of other problems on the notes packet that I'm looking at right now that, that you probably have available to you. And it's got some other questions that are good questions but not really the type of questions that we ask in AP Calculus anymore. And so I'm just going to decline to do those. I might do that, uh, you know, in a separate video, um, you know, because it's like maximizing a function for all real numbers or the point on the curve nearest to a given point. Both of these are things that, you know, I just don't think we're going to really want to do right now. Um, for now, I just need you to be able to run the candidates test and start to think about the one and zero interior critical point situation. And that's all I got for you. So thanks for watching.